The 16 NLP Presuppositions Part 1, Patience and Understanding. That's always a good thing, isn't it? How do we understand each other? Well, there's basic assumptions that NLP presupposes that occurs for every single client that we ever see. So practitioners have this basic understanding of how people operate, and it really makes a difference on how we work with people and help them with their outcome. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Best Years Podcast. This is Dr. Darlene at WhatStopsYou.com. Are you a teenager or a young parent, baby boomer, or in your golden years? The best years are now in each stage of development. So I've got power tools for you today that will help you make amazing changes so you can show up in the world with your amazingness. Once upon a time, in about 1970, two men decided to go to lunch. And as they were talking about their vocations, the computer programmer and the linguist decided that they had a whole lot in common with their industries. They noticed that the linguist, the way that we speak and the way we think inside, is the same as a computer. Input in, input out. And there's a structure and a system to thinking. Well, they decided to play with this, and they modeled people who were successful. Bandler and Grinder got busy. They created NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. This is the process of modeling someone who does something really super well and saying, hmm, they don't have stage fright. What do they do? Let's see. What is it that they do? Or what is it that they don't do? Well, they think in this color or they hear voices in their head or they're feeling this in their body. They're not grounded or they're seeing everyone making fun of them and hearing everyone making fun of them if they speak if they don't speak well. And if they do speak well, they notice that they hear accurately and they're seeing the eyes of the audience and they're actually giving giving a gift of their knowledge or the song that they're singing. So if we modeled what they're doing when they're speaking well and we teach that structure to someone else, then that someone else can go through the steps and have the same outcome. How amazing is that? They went on and on to find different modalities and different exercises to to understand this. For example, if someone has a trigger from, say, a past relationship and they drive by a certain store and get triggered in NLP, what does someone do that doesn't get triggered? And we map and model that and teach it to someone else. And when that person does that same structure in their mind, they don't have the trigger anymore. So it's amazing. It's powerful. Now, here's the thing that I'd like to talk about today. There's just so much to this is there's presuppositions, as I mentioned, that we suppose when we as practitioners, NLP practitioners and or coaches, therapists work with with clients. So just as a geologist has presuppositions about the earth, so does a helper. A geologist must assume and have assumptions and basic beliefs that gravity exists. Yeah, of course. And that photosynthesis does happen and that wind will occur and that natural phenomena are earthquakes, etc., and flooding. And so with these basic assumptions that the earth, or the, excuse me, the, the moon and the sun will rise, then they can go to work with data, researching, understanding, and then go to learn more about the earth based on those assumptions. Without the assumptions, they wouldn't have a baseline. So the great thing is, in NLP, we have basic assumptions, and there's 16 of them-ish, and I've made up kind of my own, and I think practitioners sometimes do that. So I'm going to go over the 16 in four different parts. Today, I'll be going over, let's see, I'll be going over four of them and explain these basic assumptions. And these basic assumptions that I'm talking about today are going to help you in understanding others' feelings. You're going to learn how to understand people. Of course, patience and understanding will come from that. Um, you'll help. It'll help you understand life, understanding thoughts. It's just. It's just so cool. And then about empathy and how that works. And you'll you'll get into forgiveness as well as we go through the 16. So, are we ready? And you may want to write these down. All right. NLP presupposition number one. 
Behind every behavior is a positive intention. Hmm. So what does that mean? Their behavior is stealing something at the grocery store. Now, what could possibly be a positive intention of that? Well, if you go deep enough and underneath, then you will find a positive intent for the person who stole. When a helper, and I'm going to say helper for therapist, count, coach, all of those kind of helping industries and uh, NLP practitioners. So a helper, a helper always looks for the underneath deep, deep, deep intent. And so the behavior on the outside is just a symptom. So stealing is a symptom, the intent, the positive intent for the person underneath it all to steal something at the grocery store is to feel power, is to have the thing they stole, which gives them possession. Maybe it's to be cool with their friends as they're doing it. Look at me, I stole this thing at the store. Let's say uh, the behavior is taking drugs in high school. What would your teenager's positive intent be for taking drugs? Or let's say smoking out behind the school. Well, it might be to look cool. Uh, at that point, it's probably not to numb their feelings, but many drug addiction and use and abuse is to numb feelings. Well, that's a positive intent. It may be to be respected by their peers. It may be to just do something. I'm going to do something that's scary and I'm going to overcome it. Or I'm just curious. So the positive intent is curiosity to use and abuse and use the drugs. So every single behavior in the world has a positive intent. I uh, volunteered for years out at Wasatch Youth Center and Decker Lake in Salt Lake. And that's a secure facility for adolescents who are who have done really severe crimes before age 18. And they're incarcerated and it's it's inpatient, it's full time. So I would go in there and do workshops and it was it was just one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I would tell them about this positive intention thing and they'd say, okay, then it's okay that I beat up my buddy because it's positive. No, 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 you're not listening. So I would explain it again. The behavior sucks. Don't get me wrong. And they'd look at me like, what? Yeah, your behavior sucks. And oh, now you're in jail. Uh Uh-huh. And underneath it all, digging down, was your intent to be cool. Yeah. Or your intent was to fit in. Yeah. Or your intent was to protect yourself right? Or your positive intent was to protect your mother or your siblings. So underneath it all, digging deep, you will find a positive intent for every behavior. And you can't find of one, find a behavior that doesn't have one. Okay, let's stretch it. Since I worked in the prisons, I have really extreme examples. What's the positive intent for murdering someone? Okay, well, so you have to go deep, deep on that one. Well, the intent was to protect self. The intent was to set a boundary, a little bit of a serious boundary, pretty serious, that boundary there. You could have thought of something different, yet that's what you did. So the intent is deep down underneath it all. And isn't that so cool? So the next presupposition fits right into this one. And it says that everyone is doing the best they can with the resources they know. So you can see that that fits with the first one of behind every behavior is a positive intention. So if everyone's doing the best they can with the resources they know, then stealing a car is the best they knew. Well, some people won't think that makes sense. Yet to a helper, it does because with the resources they know, the brain neurology that's firing and transmitting the options they have in the behavior in front of them, they're doing the best they can with what they know. And so they stole a car with the intention of power, control, freedom, etc. So you can see how as helpers, we need to go really down deep underneath the behavior. Now, as you're learning this as a quote layman, you can now have a little bit more understanding, maybe forgiveness, You don't have to like what someone does, but you get it. It's like, oh, that's why people do that. That's why they did that. So as a helper, a coach, how about a parent? If you understand that your child, even an adult child, is doing the best they can with what they know, then you say, oh, that's why they were rude. Because that's 
that's what they know to do, or that's why they aren't helpful at all. <laughs> or they modeled my ex, that's why. But underneath it all, it's an intent for them. And underneath it all, they're doing the best they can with what they know. So what do we do when we have permission to teach, say a parent, or if you're a school teacher, or if you're a friend, you may share other resources with this person. Remember, always ask permission to share and help and teach. What do you need to help them with in resources with their permission? And so if they have different resources, they can make different decisions. Now, what I love about my coaching, my tutoring, my mentoring, is uh, when I know what their in- intent is underneath it all, then I can say, well, so you want freedom, so you stole a car. Well, would you like to know new ways to have freedom you hadn't thought of before besides stealing a car? Would you like to have power and control in a new way besides stealing something at the grocery store or beating up your brother? Would you like new ways of having control different than beating up your brother? Would you like new ways of feeling free instead of running away? So we go to the intent underneath and acknowledge it and find new ways to accomplish it different than the behavior you chose already that kind of got you in jail or got you grounded or made your friends hate you. So it's really actually super simple when you think of it that way. And through this way of thinking comes such empathy and love for the addict in front of me, for that precious human being that's reached out for help, for that amazing person that has so many qualities they just haven't refined yet. It causes complete and utter understanding as a helper. And knowing their intent is just to be free or control or whatever, we can really not only help the person, but really honor, respect, have patience and understanding beyond measure. And as a layman, again, as you're listening to this, you can now have that patience and understanding for others when you really contemplate behind every behavior is a positive intention. Everyone is doing the best they can with the resources they know. Excellent. Let's move on. The third one I'll talk about today is there is no such thing as failure, only feedback. So I want you to think about something that you failed in, in your mind so far in your life. Oh, that was a failure. It was a failed marriage. It was, I failed at losing weight. I failed at being friendly. I failed at a relationship with my my spouse, my parent, my friend, my child. I failed at parenting. I failed in school. So as you think about the things that you failed in, and you also realize that the presupposition, the basic assumption for helpers is that there's no such thing as failure. So how would you know you're doing well if you couldn't compare yourself to somebody else or compare to something? So when you compare yourself to your, your own progress and you think you failed, well, then it's feedback. Have you ever been in school and you ask the teacher, okay, so wait. How do, how do we do this assignment again? And they tell you, now you know. If you hadn't, that's not necessarily failing, but you, you need the guidance along the way. We need a map along the way to know where we're going. And when you, ha, ha, this happened to me yesterday, I'm going to call it a failure. <laughs> and then I'll have to call it feedback because I got a ticket. Ugh. Yeah. How many times do you get a ticket? And you're so upset and you, you just, your stomach is sick and it's just money. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to give money to the state now because the freaking officer, blah, blah, blah. And I can't believe that, la, la, la. And oh, I got a ticket. And so, yeah, you know, my officer said to me yesterday, he looked at me and I go, ah, see, I hadn't registered my Toyota FJ for three months because it was, stored away for the season and I had just moved this last year so the notification came to the wrong house. So hello. Yeah, wasn't paying attention because I was driving a different car. So he looked at me and he said, Yeah, I bet you'll never do that again. And as I drove away I went, You are right, because let me just be honest with you, I got a ticket two months ago for a rolling stop. 
And I was so mad because, hello, I had to be in the left lane to turn turn right because I had to turn left immediately. And there was a bunch of cars coming. But anyway, cop was right there. And guess what I do now? I always stop at that, that place because I had the feedback. You have to stop here. So did I fail? Felt like it. Well, what's the feedback? Yeah, I won't do that again. Or I'll make sure I stop at stoplights or stop signs. So there is no failure. There's only feedback. You know the metaphor and the principle that you have to break down your muscles, your biceps, by doing reps to fail, not to failure, but to fatigue and overload. And then you stop and you rest and then you do it again. And that overload almost to failure is is feedback to stop. So you stop and then it grows because you stopped. You went to that that almost failure. So in all things you think of that you failed at, I'd like you to think back now, what have you failed at? And I want you to tell me right now out loud, yell it in your room, what did you learn? Ah, yep, you learn never to do that again. Or you learn, yeah, I got to do that. Or, oh, you turned that way. I remember going from Salt Lake to Lake Powell years and years ago. And we missed, and it's like, you know what, I don't know, four-hour drive-ish, and freaking took the wrong road and went four hours out of the way. Literally, we were in like a forest. We're like, hmm, I don't remember a forest being on the way to Lake Powell. And indeed, that was feedback that, oh, yeah, we're supposed to turn on that junction. So we didn't do that again. So what have you failed at? What did you learn? Maybe write that down. There's no failure, only feedback. And isn't that cool? And you've heard Edison or whoever invented whatever, how many times they failed. The guy who, rabies, what was his name? He invented the rabies vaccine. How many times did he fail before he succeeded? So did he really fail? Or was he just having, oh, that's feedback. Oh, I'm getting some feedback today. I got some feedback. Yeah, I'm having some feedback. And that can even be in communications. You compliment someone and they say, well, what do you mean by that? And you go, oh, that's, I've got to change the way I'm communicating. So, and we're going to get a lot into communication in the next podcast for the presuppositions. But honestly, if something's not working, you do something different because of the feedback that you get. Isn't that great? I really love these presuppositions. Next one, people always make the best choice available to them at the time. And that's very similar to number two. Everyone's doing the best they can. So number four is really similar. People always make the best choice available to them at the time. So think about that based on the other ones I've talked about. The best choice is to lie. The best choice is to not come to your party. Best choice is to be rude to you. The best choice is to sleep in and not go to work and get fired. Is that really the best choice available to them if they slept in and they got fired? Well, for one, that's feedback. For two, they're doing the best they can. For three, behind every behavior is a positive intent. They maybe needed the break, the relaxation, the release. They maybe were unconsciously sabotaging themselves to get fired. And self-sabotage, of course, is my brand. It's my website, What Stops You. Self-sabotage is really the core of my whole company. And so they're probably sabotaging themselves possibly there. And people always make the best choice available to them at the time. So as parents, helpers, coaches, friends, we maybe can share more resources. Otherwise, we accept people as they are and understand that underneath everything is them doing the best they can with the choices that they have at the time. So there are four of the 16 presuppositions that we'll cover. This has been part one and looking forward to hanging out with you in part two. So thanks for listening. I hope that really helped you. Add some comments, let me know, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to my channel so we can hang out. Also, go to whatstopsyou.com for notes to this podcast, more articles, and more tips so you can indeed live the best years of your life now.